Hi, everybody. Welcome to our December 2025 end of the year quiz. Oh, my goodness, has 2025 gone by so quickly? Well, I have 10 cases to help you celebrate the end of December and take you into 2026. So without further ado, let's get started. The most likely diagnosis for this mass is, well, what do we see? This is a great case. There's a mass in the bladder. You can see contrast excretion into the bladder. The mass is smooth, homogeneous. It's not something outside the bladder pushing in like an implant or something in the ovary. It's really a primary bladder mass. It's smooth, and so it's a bladder lyomyoma, which is uncommon. When we do see them, they're very tiny. This is one of the largest ones I've ever seen. Bladder sarcomas are irregular. You don't get duplication cysts in the bladder, and it's not an implant from an ovarian mass or anything else. A very nice example of a bladder lyomyoma. The best diagnosis in this case of an incidental finding is, well, you can see this little dot coming off the aortic valve leaflet, which is C on the 3D rendering going upward into the lumen, and it's coming from the aortic valve. It's not a flow-related change, and it's not a foreign body. The differential typically is thrombus off the aortic valve versus an unusual tumor, which occurs classically here, which is a papillary fibroastoma. Typically, when you have thrombus, it extends down into the chamber. When you have a papillary fibroelastoma like here, it extends into the upper aortic lumen, which is the case. These tumors will be resected. If not, they can embolize. A beautiful example of a papillary fibroelastoma. They can be this small or they can be large. Very easy to miss if you're not careful. The most likely diagnosis in this case is, well, when I look hard, I see a mass in the duodenum. The mass is vascular, and I see that the right kidney is missing. If I only see the mass, I could think about an adenocarcinoma or a gist or even a carcinoid tumor. Those are all possibilities, and perhaps a carcinoid might be the best thought. But with an absent kidney, what you're dealing with is renal cell carcinoma metastatic to the small bowel. In this case, it was the duodenum. One of the things we talk about cure at five years, some of these patients who have recurrence in the duodenum or in the pancreas with renal cell carcinoma will have the recurrence 10 to 15 years later. So it's something you need to look at very carefully. The most likely diagnosis in this patient with acute chest pain is, well, when you look, you do not see a type A or a type B dissection. This is not the look of Takayashi's aortitis. What you see here is diffuse soft tissue thickening around the arch and descending thoracic aorta. It's high density. It's the classic appearance of an intramural hematoma. Sometimes you'll see a small ulceration from the aortic lumen into the hematoma. I don't see it in this case, and surely not in the images. Patients with intramural hematoma will be treated conservatively, and often this will resolve over a couple of weeks. This is really a nice example of intramural hematoma. The most likely diagnosis in this case, well, when you look quickly, there's a cystic lesion near the upper pole of the kidney and near the adrenal bed. So I can see why you would say an adrenal cyst or a renal cyst or a duplication cyst. When you look at the sagittal views, you realize what you're dealing with is a diverticulum off the posterior gastric wall hanging downward. And duodenal uh, lesions at times when their diverticulums can be confused with pancreatic head masses and diverticulum off the stomach when it's posterior, this is the classic location, can easily confuse you with an adrenal process or even a pancreas process at times. So this is a very nice example of a gastric diverticulum. Again, the sagittal view makes it oh so easy, as you can see the communication very, very nicely. In this patient with left upper quadrant pain and sepsis, the best diagnosis is, well, 
when I look at the stomach, the stomach shows a thick wall, but there's air in the wall of the stomach. You can see that again when you look at the coronal views. It's really the inferior aspect of the stomach. What could this be? Gastritis is a possibility, but you don't see air in the gastric wall from just simple gastritis. Ulcers, you can have perforation. You can have air at the level of the ulcer and a perforation, but this is more in the wall. Lymphoma is not going to do this. This is gastric emphysema, very much like colonic air or small bowel air. This is air in the gastric wall. It's an emergency. Patients have a high rate of morbidity and mortality from this process. Sometimes the patients will need a gastrectomy. It's, again, often due to ischemia. When you see gastric emphysema like this, you want to look really carefully at the mesenteric vessels, look carefully at the small and large bowel as well. In this patient with pelvic pain, the best diagnosis is the thing you see is what's going on in the soft tissues over the buttock bilaterally. You see the gluteal maximus and medius muscle, but what's going on in the soft tissue? Well, you can have infiltration in the soft tissue by lymphoma, but this is symmetric and diffuse. This is not the look of neurofibromatosis, which is off the skin, and it's not hemorrhage. What this is is silicon injection into the buttocks. This was a cosmetic procedure. Patients can develop necrotizing fasciitis. They can develop discomfort. But you need to recognize this because you don't want to confuse it with any other process, especially not infection or malignancy. In this patient with right upper quadrant pain and no history of trauma, the best diagnosis is. This was a tough case. When you look at the two images, you see what looks like multiple lesions, some having vascularity. When I looked at it at first, in a patient with really no history and a relatively younger patient, I considered multiple hemangiomas, and this was also thought from the MR. It doesn't have the look of FNH nor hepatic adenomas unless you had multiple adenomas and some of them bled but it has a very unusual appearance along the capsule of the liver. Eventually, we weren't sure what was going on. This was biopsied and was an angiosarcoma of the liver. Angiosarcomas of the liver are very rare, but the appearance usually is a hypervascular lesion with infiltration and irregularity. Here, the liver looks pretty reasonable except for the lesions present, and this was a most unusual appearance of a most unusual tumor, biopsy, cold turkey on the PATH report of an angiosarcoma of the liver. What a great case. The key finding on this coronary CTA in a patient with chest pain is, well, what I see here is you can see the left main coronary artery and then the LAD and circumflex, and then you see there's another vessel coming in the groove between the ascending aorta and main pulmonary artery. And that's going to be the right coronary artery. You can see it nicely on the 3D as well. And this is an anomalous origin of the right coronary artery from the left cusp. And because it tracks between the ascending aorta and pulmonary artery, this would typically be called a malignant, or at least it's a concerning anomaly because of compression. And you can get infarction from this. This is not a case of LAD occlusion or stenosis or RCA occlusion. We just don't have the entire vessels present, but just a really nice example of anomalous origin of the right coronary artery from the left cusp. The least likely diagnosis in this case is, well, I see a mass in the mesentery to the right of midline and the right lower quadrant. Now, things I think about are carcinoid. I think about lymphoma. Sclerosis mesenteritis, I don't think about because usually they're irregular and have dense calcification. Other tumors in the mesentery can be desmoid tumors, particularly in patients with familial polyposis, but even without that. You can think of Castleman's disease, but sclerosis mesenteritis, to me, I need to see calcification, which is present in greater than 70% of cases. 
I don't see any desmoplastic reaction, but to me the least likely diagnosis would be sclerosing mesenteritis. This, by the way, was a desmoid tumor, a really nice case. Anyway, thank you, thank you, thank you for all your support during 2025. I hope you like these cases. You can go back and look at them. We have like 20 years on file, and you can look on CTSS at the app, which has all the cases. And let me be the first one to tell you and wish you a happy 2026, which is on the way. Anyway, have a great day, a great month, and see you next year. Be good. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.